Okay, we're going to begin our joint city Nueces County press briefing. I don't know if folks can. Uh... Okay, I just want to get everybody quiet so we can hear, so everybody can hear. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Peter Zanoni, Corpus Christi City Manager. We're going to begin our joint Nueces County City of Corpus Christi COVID-19 press briefing. There'll be three presenters today. It'll be myself, and then following me will be Annette Rodriguez, our Public Health Director, our Joint City-County Public Health uh, Department Director. And then following her, we're going to try to save most of our time for our guest uh, presenters, Dr. F Philippe Tussaud and Dr. Chris Bird from Corpus Christi's uh, Texas A&M uh, University here. If this is the first time you're watching, uh, Texas A&M has helped the city and county out now four or five weeks in helping us use data and national models to show predictability and, and modeling of, of cases here in Nueces County, uh, both in terms of uh, potential positive cases, but recovery rates, impacts on uh, uh, mixing in groups as evidenced by cell phone tracking data and so on. So they have a, another presentation that they'll be presenting today. Some of it's updated information, but there's some new analysis that they've conducted and, and that's going to be real good to watch. So uh, hold tight if you're watching now because that's certainly the, will be the highlight of today's press briefing. We do know that a lot of folks are watching this on YouTube and Facebook, as well as some of our local channels, and we know the Call of Times covers it as well. And so our message to you all watching is we appreciate you watching. We're glad that you are doing so. We want you to make, we, want, we hope and we, um, we're trying to explain it so that you can understand the information. And then uh, if you can pass it along as well to your family and friends, church members and neighbors, it's important that we learn about this, how to stay safe, but also see the implications of some of our actions. As some of our graphs are going to show today, uh, cases are going up when we look week over week. We're having more positives on a seven-day tracking trajectory this week than we did last week. And it's not in part, it's not in total because we're doing more testing. It's also because of transmission, and maybe we're not doing everything we should be doing to minimize the spread. So for that reason, we need to listen and, and pass this information along and, and follow some of the prescribed measures that the CDC, the state, and even our local health authorities are telling us to do. Okay, so with that, let's begin with some of the statistics. Um, every day at 4 o'clock, we look back at the past 24 hours to see how many new cases, if any, have we uh, picked up in Nueces County. And so since yesterday at 4 o'clock, uh, today, we're reporting five additional cases for Nueces County. Yesterday, we had a total of 123 con uh, cases. This is both confirmed cases that, ha that has somebody that still has the virus, as well as cases that may have recovered or persons that may have recovered. With the five additional, that brings us up to 128 cases for Nueces County. And I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but 58% uh, of those, or 73 persons of the 128, have recovered already. So our working number is, uh, is, a, is a smaller number, 52 uh, still have the, the virus out of the 128. In Nueces County, we've tracked three deaths in total, uh, or to date, I should say, three deaths. Uh, two are from the city of Corpus Christi, one is from Robstown. One of the persons in Corpus Christi was actually working for the past two months or so in Nevada. He was a traveling nurse, but were required by CDC and state guidelines to count them at his home base, which is here. He had a home, a permanent residency here, even though he would leave for extended periods of time working as a traveling nurse. We look at the, uh, at the number of male and female uh, cases. So of those 128 positives that we've had to date, 53% are male and 47% are female. In the five new cases today, four were male and one was female. For the community, we also show a distribution of the cases by age, ranging over nine age groups from zero to 90 plus years of age. There's a 10 year spread between the ages of 20 to 80. So we have a 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, and so on. There's a pretty even distribution of the cases from that 20-year-old 20 20 year bracket to the 79-year-old bracket. 
And um, so there's a pretty even distribution. The number of cases, though, from zero to 19 has increased uh, kind of significantly in the last couple of days, frankly. Uh, there's a total of nine cases now in that category. It increased by three today. Uh, so we're, we're up to nine in that category. In the other categories, it's a, it ranges from a low of 13 to a high of 26, uh, but the mid-ranges are, are in the 20s for those other, uh, other age categories. Okay, and then testing is important, and we're going to show some information on testing. Uh, but before I do that, I guess let's, they did put this graph up. So this shows, if you look at a two-week spread over here, I'm um, trying to find the, let's see, this is the start of our week, a, a week ago, where that zero is, 5-2. So if we just look at this side, you can see this week we have a lot of, of higher numbers, right? F sixes, fives, uh, threes. If we look back a week, we had several zeros in a row. And if we look back, I think a day or so prior to the beginning of that week, we actually had more zeros in that week span. So over our two-week period, you can see where we had several zeros. That's being replaced now unfortunately by several consecutive numbers and some rather significant ones for our area. Uh, so this week, two sixes and a five and a three, where a week ago we had several zeros and um, a two, a three, and there was one five in there. But the point is, we think we're seeing, or we know we're seeing, uh, more cases on a daily basis. And in part, that, is a little, has, that has a little bit to do with, with testing. We're increasing testing. In fact, over the past four weeks in Nueces County, our testing has increased 338%. And so we, if you look back four weeks ago, uh, for the whole week, we tested about 350 people. This week, when we include today's numbers, we're well above uh, 1,400 tests performed, right? But testing alone is not the contributing factor to the increase in the number of cases we're seeing, because even back here when we had low cases, like zeros, we were still doing more testing day over day and week over week. So while testing is up, so is transmission and spread. And so that's why we need to be mindful about how not to catch the virus and listen to some of those uh, health practices. Okay, so the numbers on the testing include today, we have tested in our labs 131 specimens. And then the hospitals, the clinics, and the physicians have uh, sent out for testing 80 uh, tests or 80 specimens. So over 211 or 211 tests performed today. When we look at the total number to date, it's well above 1%, or it's above, I should say, 1% of the total county population. Because today we're at 3,984 tests performed. There's about 360,000 persons in Nueces County. So yesterday, in fact, is where we kind of reached that 1% mark. Uh, today, we're above the 1% mark of all the population, which is good. And that's something that the community has repeatedly stated, and we've seen it on our Facebook posts and that type of things as we do these press briefings. So just one more uh, recap on testing. So yesterday, the judge, the mayor, myself, uh, were at a press briefing with Dr. Blow, and he unveiled Krista Spahn's a Cepheid machine that can test a thousand specimens a day. Today in our labs, um, over a, you know an eight to twelve hour period, we can do about 130. Right. So we're if we had the ability, if we had the test specimens to test, we could test a thousand right now, compared to a little over a hundred. One issue we want to point out to the community is we need people to test, and so Annette's going to talk about that when she talks. Uh, when she presents, which is that the criteria has been relaxed uh, since uh, back in the beginning when CDC was, had some tight restrictions. But we can only test if people want to get tested and show up to the test events. And so while we have that ability to do uh, well over a thousand now a day, uh, we have to have persons that are willing and think they might have symptoms or want to get tested. And so uh, Annette will talk about that as well. Okay, now let's move on to uh, this recovery rate we talked about. So of the 128 persons, when we take out the three deceased, uh, that leaves us with persons that have the virus still and those that have recovered. And so as we can see in this uh, chart here, 73 persons have recovered to date, and that's well above the 50% uh, level, so 58% in fact have recovered. That leaves us with 52 persons that are still impacted with the virus. 
We also like to talk about for the community who's in the hospital. We have a total of uh, seven persons in the hospital today. That's the same number as yesterday. And of those seven, three are in intensive care. And that is the same as yesterday as well. The community wants to know of the new cases, where are they from? And today, the five additional cases that we're monitoring or tracking now, they're all from Corpus Christi. So that leaves, uh, that's 110 in Corpus Christi, two from Robstown. <clears throat> we have seven from Port Aransas, seven from rural Nueces County, one from Awadulce, and then one from Bishop. And that totals at 128 since the beginning. Okay, so <clears throat> let me just see if we covered everything on the testing. We, um, I think that's it. Oh, just what, this one other graph we updated uh, from yesterday <clears throat> to show that if you look at the, at the red line, it shows a seven-day average of testing. And you can see that even since yesterday, that line continues to go up. And in part, that's from the National Guard's testing. That this was a, th a third day of testing here in our county. And they did some pretty significant numbers, but we've done drive-through testings also Monday and Thursday. And so <clears throat> you can see the seven day, the blue bars show the daily counts of tests that have been performed. But when you look at the red line, that's the average, the rolling average. And so you can see our seven day average continues to increase. Uh, and that's what we want for the community. I have, before Annette comes up, I'm gonna do an update on library services, but did you wanna translate? Uh, okay, we'll translate these numbers real quick and then I'll do a quick update on our library services that's, that'll begin to open in a partial way on Monday. En resumen, las cifras más recientes indican que en las últimas 24 horas se han reportado cinco casos confirmados por el coronavirus, haciendo un total de 128. 68 son hombres, 60 son mujeres. La mayoría se encuentran en el rango de edades entre 30 y 39 años. A la fecha se han llevado a cabo 3,984 pruebas por el virus entre el Distrito de Salud Pública y laboratorios privados. De los 128 casos, 110 son residentes de la ciudad de Corpus Christi, 2 son residentes de Robstown, 7 son residentes de Port Aranzas, 7 residentes de áreas rurales. 73 de los 128 casos se han recuperado por completo, o sea, más de un 50%. 33 han sido hospitalizados, 7 continúan en el hospital, 3 en condición crítica en la unidad de cuidados intensivos, 52 casos aún se encuentran activos. A la fecha se han reportado 3 fallecimientos. Okay, thank you, Gabby. All right, I'm gonna just do a quick update on our library services. As the community may be aware, we're beginning to reopen uh, City Hall a uh, little bit at a time. We have a phased approach. Not everybody is coming back to work and not everything's opening all at once. And so we wanna announce that our library services will begin to reopen in a kind of a phased manner beginning Monday. I believe we have a chart for that. So effective Monday, our libraries will offer a service at the, at the library, um, at all our library locations, and that includes our, our downtown library, the central library, and we have five branches out there in the community. Library services will be available, that'll des describe in a minute, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday. So at all six libraries beginning Monday, <clears throat> 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday, what we'll be offering is computer internet access, our libraries are very popular for that. People use the computers to fill out job applications, search for jobs, do other research. Computer internet access will be available, but it will be uh, reserved time. You'll have to reserve the time to use the computer, and the time blocks are, are for an hour and a half each session. The copy machine use will be available as well, and reservations will be required for that. There's a 30 minute uh, limitation on the use of the copy machine. And we're still, uh, we're still, well, access to public review documents will be also uh, through a reservation. So if somebody wants to review uh, public documents, that will be through reservation as well. Uh, what I should have said in the beginning, though, is uh, through the whole uh, COVID uh, pandemic that we've had here, our libraries have still remained open in that persons can call in or, res or check uh, on the internet and get a book checked out and then we have, have had drive-through services, and so they've come and picked up the book at the library, and they've returned it through the book drop. But these improved services, including that computer internet access, copy machine use, and access to public review documents will begin Monday, Monday through Friday, from 10 to 6. And um, curbside service for library materials, that has been between the hours of 2 to 5.30, and that'll continue. 
So to make a reservation, you want to call our library number that's been uh, developed for this. It may, it's here on the chart. It's at um, 826-7055. There's a series of prompts that you'll hear at that number, so just follow the prompts and the phone uh, once you dial and, and receive the, the answering service. So 361-826-7055 is the number. The book drop is open for returns, and uh, any items checked out prior to Friday, March 20th, must be returned by Friday, May 29, just to give those a heads up out there that may have checked out some books. Okay, so that's a quick update in our library. We're glad the community continues to utilize our library services. Uh, we have a great library staff and a great director, uh, Laura uh, uh, Garcia, our director, is doing a great job. And uh, we, we know this service is important to the community, so uh, we want to thank the community for continuing to use it and take advantage of some of these new services that are available. We're going to do a translation on that in Spanish, and then um, we'll hear from Annette Rodriguez. Desde el próximo día lunes, las bibliotecas públicas van a reabrir, aunque con acceso limitado. El horario de servicio es de 10 de la mañana a 6 de la tarde, de lunes a viernes. Los accesos a las computadoras, a los documentos públicos y las impresoras estarán limitados solo para personas que hayan hecho una reservación. Solo se va a permitir la entrada a las personas que cuenten con una reservación. Deberán de contar con un cubrebocas y deberán de practicar el distanciamiento social. Para realizar una reservación se le pide llamar con anticipación al 826-7055. También estará abierta el área para la recolección de libros que hayan sido retirados de las bibliotecas antes del 20 de marzo. La fecha límite para la entrega de esos libros es el viernes 29 de mayo. Thank you. Good afternoon, Annette Rodriguez, Health Director. The Health District's next drive-through will be on Monday, May the 11th, for any STX meat processing plant family members that are symptomatic and wanting to get tested. They can call this number, 361-414-6200. We will be there at the Old Memorial parking lot between 8 and 11 a.m. The Health District will be in Bishop, Texas, on Tuesday, May the 12th at 8 a.m. Please call the hotline at 361-826-7200 if you're sick and you have any of the COVID-19 symptoms to get registered. You can also call the number 548-2567 to get registered for the Bishop uh, drive through The National Guard will be in Portland for the rest of the weekend. To make an appointment, you can call 512-883-2400 or you can visit uh, texascovidtest.org. I want to clarify a point on COVID-19 persons in our community. COVID-19 positive persons are not allowed to go to work. No one should be allowed to go to work sick. So even that much more if you have a very contagious virus such as COVID-19. It is important that everyone understand whether your business is essential or non-essential, you cannot go to work if you are positive for COVID-19. The only way you can go back to work is when you are fully recovered and you have met the CDC criteria to return to work. This week, we celebrate Nurses Week. You've heard this all week from us. I wanted to also say a big thank you uh, to all of our nurses in Nueces County. They are doing so much for our community, so I needed to say thank you uh, to them. Also, a very, very special thank you to my health district nurses who have been doing a phenomenal job during the COVID-19 crisis. This pandemic is unprecedented and they have stepped up to the plate without complaining and continue to help to do everything possible uh, to mitigate this virus. Thank you to the public. I know I'm saying things that sound repetitive and they are. It continues to be the same message because these practices work and we will continue um, these measures will continue to be effective even when the crisis is over to reduce the number of infections such as seasonal flu. Enjoy this Mother's Day weekend. Stay safe and healthy by remembering these public health measures. Wash your hands for at least 20 seconds and do it often. Do not touch your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. Avoid people who are sick. Always cover your cough and sneezes with the tissue, then throw the tissue in the trash and wash your hands again. If you are sick, stay at home. When you go out, use a face mask. Practice social distancing of six feet or more from others. 
Have a great Sunday with your families. As always, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay informed. Thank you. En resumen, la próxima visita del, al Distrito de Salud será el martes 12 de mayo a las 8 de la mañana en la ciudad de Bishop. Cualquier persona con síntomas del virus debe de llamar a la oficina del secretario de la ciudad de Bishop para registrarse. El número es el 361-584-2567. La Guardia Nacional estará en Portland por el resto del fin de semana. Para hacer una cita, llame al 512 883-2400. Quisiéramos aclarar que las personas que resultan positivo al virus no deben ir a trabajar, especialmente cuando tienen síntomas, ya que cuentan con un virus muy contagioso. Solamente debe de regresar al trabajo una vez que se haya recuperado por completo. Esta semana se celebra la Semana de los Enfermeros, por lo que quiero agradecer a los enfermeros de mi Distrito de Salud y por todo su esfuerzo realizado durante este tiempo sin precedentes. Quisiéramos también agradecer a los residentes que han hecho todo lo posible por evitar más contagios. Sabemos que toda esta información es muy repetitiva, pero se ha demostrado que está teniendo los resultados que esperábamos y evitar más contagios siguiendo las pausas sanitarias. Disfrute de este fin de semana del Día de la Madre de manera segura y saludable. Lávese las manos durante al menos 20 segundos. No toque sus ojos, nariz o boca con las manos sin, sin lavar. Evite estar cerca de personas enfermas. Siempre cubra su tos y estornudos. Si está enfermo, quédese en casa. Cuando salga, use un cubrebocas y continúe practicando el distanciamiento social. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Chris Bird. I'm an associate professor of life sciences at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. I'm here as a representative of the Corpus Christi TAMU CC COVID-19 Modeling Task Force to give our weekly report. Seems that manager Zanoni is getting more advanced in his statistical analysis and maybe taking some of the load off my shoulders, which I appreciate. I just want to remind everybody that the objectives of the task force are twofold. First, we want to address public concerns and questions about COVID-19 and the interventions that are being put in place to control its transmission. And two, to enable evidence-based decision making by our leaders Um, so that we can all stay safe while also remaining as po prosperous as possible. This report is for the 12-county Coastal Bend area. It's not just for Nueces County, um, so I think it's important to point that out. So some of the numbers that we're showing are going to be a little bit different than what Manager Zanoni showed. Also, the numbers we're showing are generally from yesterday, and we haven't updated anything for today yet. So, Each week, I start with a graph of the cumulative total number of cases, which are positive for COVID-19, in the Coastal Bend area. And this week, we're seeing an acceleration in the cases. And I want to bring everybody's attention into this boxed area here in the upper uh, corner. Uh, there's total, uh, currently 166 cases in the whole Coastal Bend area. Total um, of those, there's 101 recoveries uh, that, that we know of right now. And the way that we know that this is a sign of acceleration is that this is a cumulative curve. When we get to the top of the mountain, we level off and we stay at the same level. Now what's happened is last week we were leveling off, but now with a new week's worth of data, it becomes more clear that we're actually starting to turn back up again. So that's what an accelerating amount of cases looks like. In Nueces, again, the number of cases are lower, and I defer to Manager Zanoni's slides if they were updated for today. These are yesterday's numbers. Okay, the second thing that we like to do is make a comparison with San Antonio. And the purpose of this comparison is that a lot of people in Corpus Christi, myself included, like to go to San Antonio. I like to go to the Riverwalk. I like to go shopping. I like to go there for a weekend. Um, it's important to me to know what's going on in San Antonio, and I think to a lot of people in the Coastal Bend also. Uh, but there's a twofold thing here, is that people from San Antonio and Bear County come to the Coastal Bend, and they uh, enjoy our beaches, and they may have beach houses and things like that, and so we're really connected uh, with this place. And so the purpose of showing this comparison is for knowledge about, you know, do, do you want to go to San Antonio this weekend um, and uh, for, your, for your edification? So we've put this on a level playing field as much as possible by um, having the number of cases cumulative total per 100,000 people. And there's approximately three times more cases total over time in Bear County, San Antonio, than uh, in the Coastal Bend, 12 counties. There's also a, a higher uh, fatality 
or fatality rate in Bear County than there is here in the Coastal Bend. And again, so far we've managed to avoid a lot of the brunt that we've of COVID-19 that we've seen on TV and in other places around the country. Um, and just to point out, Bear County is where San Antonio is uh, located. It's the majority of the people in San Antonio live in Bear County. So. This week I want to go transition from that into the cell phone data. And I like to show this, this graph because in 2008 it was mind blowing that we might be able to look at everybody's cell phone and figure out um, where the bad guy was or what, what people are doing. Here Batman used uh, cell phone data to find the Joker and uh, basically save the day. Now here we're gonna be using cell phone data to try to help inform us about what's happening in the community. And this data that we're obtaining, it's freely available to uh, people in commerce. And so if you downloaded that app and you clicked yes, uh, let, let, let me let, let you track my GPS, that could be where some of this data is coming from. I'm sure I have it on my phone, as most of you have uh, software like that on your phones. And the reason why I'm going to this now is we want to know, well, what's behind the acceleration in the number of cases in the Coastal Bend area right now? We know that there's more testing, um, but something that we also know is that there's more activity going on. And just to um, explain what's going on here, for those who haven't seen this again, what we have here is an encounter index. And we've scaled this encounter index to the Coastal Bend area, and this is explicitly Nueces County. And we made it so that the average amount of contacts that were detectable by a cell phone, and by contact or encounter, what we mean is the probability of two people making contact and the overall prob probability of that happening per kilometer squared per day in Nueces County. The way this works at a smaller scale is say two devices come within 60 meters of each other. It triggers a statistical algorithm that calculates the probability that those two phones will actually come within six feet of each other. We can't know for sure whether they do or they don't. Um, it's dependent upon that algorithm that uh, estimates that probability. But suffice to say, the longer two cell phones are within a proximity of each other, the higher the probability is that they'll come in contact with each other. That's kind of how this works. And basically, high means normal activity. 100 means that's what we were doing before we realized that COVID-19 was really here in the US and was really a threat uh, to us here in the coastal bend. And that's what's represented by that line. That's March 9th which was the first day of spring break for TAMU CC and two days before the NBA canceled its games, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, from that point forward, um, you can see that there was a precipitous decline in this index, uh, which is based upon cell phone encounters and how close they're coming together. Uh, so by the time we got to the stay at home uh, order, we were already at a low point in the amount of encounters that were happening according to this uh, index in Nueces County. Uh, but what I want to draw your attention to is right over here, right at the lower point, somewhere between April 7th and April 13th. Uh, this is Easter, by the way, that low point there to calibrate you. That's where our vigilance kind of um, waned and we started to get cabin fever. And despite the same orders being in place, we here in, in Nueces County started to behave a little bit differently. We maybe went out a little bit more than we did for the first two weeks of the stay at home. And that's what you're seeing here in the increase that's occurring in these numbers. Now, last week, um, we were kind of over in this region. And now this week, um, what you're seeing right here um, is um, not as steep of an incline, which makes me uh, feel better being, you know, living in Nueces County. But at the same time, it still has a slightly upward trend. Uh, and there is a definite phenomenon that there were uh, potentially more transmissions between people um, going from the middle of the stay at home to the end of the stay at home before the stay at home was even lifted. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we started looking at this data because this is the first, um, this is the first indication that we'll have that there might be an increase in the number of cases. Because before you can contract the symptoms of COVID-19, you have to become infected with the virus. You become infected by the, with the virus by interacting with other people uh, around you that also have the virus. So the more people you interact with, there's a linear relationship between the number of people that you interact with and your probability of contracting COVID-19. And so we were interacting with more and more people from the middle of the stay at home to the end of the stay at home. And given that lag from 
infection or to infectious, which is also about the time when you show symptoms, maybe you know, a day or two before, that's about five days. And then let's say that you become uh, symptomatic within five days, then you might you know, call your doctor, maybe you get in for a test, maybe one to two days later, so that's at seven days. And then maybe a few days after that, you're receiving the results of your test. And cl of clearly, there's gonna be a range of results here, but you're looking at somewhere um, up to two weeks period between when the amount of activity increases and when we really start seeing something in the data from one to two weeks uh, is when we expect to see that signal. Uh, one thing I like to look at is Saturdays. The, comparing each day of the week to itself, this Saturday to last Saturday, that Saturday to the Saturday before, that allows us to really see what's happening because on average, we in Coastal Bend and Nueces County, we tend to do more things on Saturdays and Fridays than we do on other days. So if you compare Saturdays to Saturdays, uh, this index indicates that there was a decrease in the proportion of encounters. Now, this gives me pause because I've been going out on a, what I term a safari to go and look and see what's happening down the SPID along the Home Depot to HEB, down to Airline and back um, over to Weber. And I thought that I saw more traffic, more people in, um, at least potentially interacting with each other. So this may indicate um, some limitation on the metric that we're using. Uh, no one thing is a silver bullet. Uh, what I did do that I'm not gonna show you is I looked at a few other metrics. They're all going up. The distance traveled, the amount of trip, trips that people have taken that were unnecessary, they've all been increasing. And so this still is uh, in uh, congruence with other metrics that, that are out there. Um, so the reason why I spent so much time on that slide is that right here is where that trough in the amount of encounters is. And what you're seeing here is the number of new cases per day in Nueces County. And I, I pulled out the rest of the coastal bend right now just so you could focus on one curve. What you can see is the trough over here and our number of cases was occurring after April 20th, April 23rd, somewhere around there. And here's where our lull in the, uh, the cell phone encounter index was uh, before it started to increase Easter. It's right around in this area right here. And so what you see this amount of time is about that one to two week window that I talked about between uh, when you contract the virus to when you show symptoms to when you go to the doctor to when you get a, a test back that's positive and you get counted. And so it seems that there's a pretty darn good relationship here between the cell phone encounter index, at least during the stay at home period, and uh, this decline in the number of cases in the Coastal Bend area. And so here's that, that time lag that I'm pointing out. And so the other thing that you wanna point, you know, pay attention to is here's another way to visualize the amount of new cases that we have uh, in Nueces County. And from about April 23rd or so through the present, there's been a steady incline. Uh, this line is a smoother, that kind of smooths out noisy data. You can see there's points all over this graph. Each point is one day's worth of new cases. And the smoother allows us to see patterns where sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to see that. And so during this period of time from the middle of, uh, or between April 20th and April 27th to, uh, I think that's yesterday, um, we have increasing number of cases in the in Nueces County. Um, and so here's the other thing. Well, what else could be explaining this increase in cases? And you saw the um, chart that uh, Manager Zanoni posted about how we're having more and more tests in the Coastal Bend area. And um, I want to talk to you about what I see in this graph. Um, these points, the points aren't just points on, on a screen. Each one of those points is a group of people. It's a group of people that tested positive for COVID-19. They, um, for some reason, got a test. Now, through time, who's getting tested is changing. And so it's very difficult to compare numbers from uh, a month ago. I mean, you cannot compare the numbers from a month ago to today without some sort of advanced uh, you know, knowledge and statistical analysis that I'm not prepared to embark upon. But even in this period of time, from April 27th to yesterday, there's been changes. We've seen that people at the meat pack packing plant are gonna get tested. We've seen that first responders are gonna get tested, and this is good. More tests are better, but it makes it so if a different population of people are getting tested for each of these points, if these points are different people, 
makes it harder and harder to compare them. Um, when we test first responders, which is great, and I hope we do more of it, when we get the data back, we don't know who didn't have symptoms and was getting tested because they're a first responder and they came back positive and, and we don't know who actually had symptoms. A few weeks ago, before April 21st, we knew that you had to meet all these different uh, CDC guidelines. So you're much more likely to have COVID-19 when you got a test before April 21st than you are today. And even over the course of this time, you're becoming more and more likely to be able to have a test if you don't have symptoms, um, which is good on one hand, but if we don't pay attention to who was symptomatic and who wasn't, then we can't necessarily take advantage of what the good that could come from testing uh, more people out there in Nueces County in the Coastal Bend area. So with that preface, this is the percent of positive tests over the past few days, past a week and a half or so. This is the percentage from zero to 5%. You can see, uh, you know, and what I said here is that the percentage of tests that are coming back positive are roughly level. Now, if the number of people that are getting tested um, from April 27th to May 7th is becoming increasingly uh, a proportion of people that are asymptomatic, then we would expect that this number would go down through time. As we test more people that are asymptomatic, we're going to get lower percentages of people that are testing positive. And next week we might, tomorrow we might, but right now we have a roughly level line. If you want to split hairs, is that going up at the end? Maybe, um, but I'm just saying that we expect it would go down given what we know about the testing and what, who the people are that are in these dots. And um, I think that's very important to recognize. So is there a relationship between the amount of testing and the amount of people testing positive? Yes. Is there a relationship between the amount of contacts that we're having or encounters with the cell phones and the number of people that are testing positive? Yes. Um, how much of a relationship is there between testing and the number of people that are testing positive? Um, if I can go with the numbers that I've looked at throughout the um, whole time that testing has been recorded here, it's been 25 and 30% of the um, differences in the number of cases can be explained by the number of tests. So that leaves 60 to 75% of something else. And I'm not saying that 60 to 75% is um, the, the transmission itself or the cell phone encounter index itself, but it's some of it. And it's very clear that that's the case. So um, one last time, we would expect this line to go down. It's staying level, if not you know, creeping up slightly. Uh, if there was uh, a, just an effect of the number of cases being a, a, fa a factor of how many people are getting tested. Um, now we can compare what's going on in Nueces County to the rest of the Coastal Bend area. This is the number of new cases per day. Last week, we were about even. We we're close to even with uh, other people in the Coastal Bend. This week, we're higher. Um, and so that would be potentially uh, one uh, data point that you could look at. Well, how many people that are getting tested are from Nueces County? versus other counties. Um, and then maybe we can um, glean some more information from that because if it's staying equal and we're getting more um, people positive in Nueces County, then that would be an indicator that there's something happening here in Nueces County. One thing that I will say is that the pattern is showing that there's clearly something different happening. The dynamics of who's contracting COVID-19 are different in Nueces County than in the other counties in the Coastal Bend area. Um, for what it's worth, well, I'm not gonna show it, San Patricio would be um, the next highest county presently in the, uh, in the trends on this graph. So the number of new cases are increasing right now, and if we get our comparison to Bear County, San Antonio, we can see there that we're you know, below that level in, in San Antonio. But again, the reason why I'm showing this is to emphasize or to um, g give us the, this view of this place that we like to go, and our, our friends from San Antonio come here and, and visit us too. Um, so we can compare and, and know what's happening somewhere else besides the Coastal Bend area. Um, so during the stay at home, I can't emphasize enough that numbers started to go up during the stay at home. And that uh, trend was predicted in, the, in Nueces County by the uh, cell phone encounter index. So let's review the interventions uh, as they stand now. So we did have a mandatory stay at home, but that ended last week, uh, May 1st, Friday. And so now we're under a recommendation that if you can stay at home, do. So if you have a job that allows you to tele 
commute, then continue to do that for sure. Two, there's loosening restrictions on um, social gatherings, public gatherings, so that's kind of um, letting our, our foot off of the, the neck of COVID-19 and giving it a, a little bit of life here. Um, but not completely, I mean, it's not back to normal by any stretch of the imagination, and I think that the cell phone encounter index really shows that. Um, we still have school closures in place for the foreseeable future. Uh, everybody's being encouraged to social distance. I was very pleased with uh, Annette's uh, uh, talk today about the importance of doing everything you can to prevent the transmission of COVID-19 and especially self-isolate self when you're symptomatic, call your doctor, then go from there. Um, try not to go into work if you're, if you're symptomatic, uh, even if you have a runny nose is what I'd recommend. And wait until you know that you don't have COVID-19. Because, I mean, it seems that we can all get tested now if we have even uh, one of the symptoms of COVID-19. If not, you know, no symptoms at all, depending on if we're a first responder or not. So these are the interventions that are in place. Um, up to this point, I've been uh, showing a model based on the state of Texas. If you don't notice, we shifted Texas up this week because now these numbers are based upon um, the Public Health District 11, which uh, goes from Corpus Christi over to Laredo and south uh, to, to the border, uh, down into McAllen and the other towns down there. And so this is a uh, metric that's more tailored to us in South Texas. Now, it's not Coastal Bend, it's not Nueces, but it includes the Coastal Bend and Nueces. And uh, last week, uh, over all of Texas, it was a, a three, and this is the average amount of people that are infected um, per person that gets sick in the first place. And the way that this works is this. And so I updated this, uh, this infographic. If you get sick with COVID-19, uh, then you're likely to transfer it to 2.9 people. Now, what does that mean? Most people that get sick will transfer it to three people, but one in, uh, one in 10 will transfer it to two people. So in one week, three people have COVID-19. Then the same dynamics work. Uh, three people get approximately three more people each sick, 2.9 people each. That ends up most likely to be nine additional people sick. And then from nine, there's 2.9 people again. So that goes to 26 people um, in the third week. And then by a month, you're at 76 people that are infected by COVID-19 from one person starting today at this rate of 2.9, which is what it would be if we weren't doing anything. If we weren't social distancing, if we weren't doing things to stop the spread of COVID-19, this is our estimate of how contagious the virus is here in South Texas. Now, this is our estimate of what the actual transmission rate is. And last week, it was 0.5. That means decline. This week, it's 1.5. That means increase. And if you want a metric against which, or a meter stick against which to compare this number, it's like the flu. Uh, this number is the num uh, about the amount of contagiousness that the flu has, and that's without interventions in place. This is COVID-19 with an interventions in place. Uh, in South Texas. This is what it looks like in terms of how many people would be infected. It's a lot better than this. Uh, so there's an indication that the efforts that we're putting forth are having an impact. But this is exponential growth. And regardless of how small this number is, if it's above one, it's 1.01, eventually it's gonna, it's gonna go up. Now it's gonna take a lot longer for it to go up. At 1.5, it's not gonna take that long. It's gonna take a few months before it really starts to take off. Also consider that this is one person. Um, there's more than one person in the coastal bend right now that has COVID-19, so that's something to consider. So uh, each week we do a projection of a model forward. Everything that you've seen up to this point is modeling what's already happened. Um, so here we're gonna project forward and we're gonna look at three scenarios. They're very similar to last week. Scenario one is what would happen if we just opened up uh, Texas from stay at home and public gatherings and things like that. If we just let everybody go back to normal, but we still social distance, we still isolate um, when symptomatic, and we still keep the schools closed. What would have happened if we just went to 100% Texas open? Now, why would we show this scenario? Uh, the reason why is to give you a meter stick. How come we didn't just open up Texas 100% last week? Um, and each of these scenarios projecting in the future are you know, showing us the range of what's possible. 
uh, moving forward. The second scenario is very similar to last week's, but we updated a little bit because it seems things are accelerating. So we allowed there to be a 50% reduction in the effectiveness of staying at home and public and the, the stopping of public gatherings uh, through um, from May 1st to May 8th, and then a 75% uh, decrease in the effectiveness from May 8th to May 15th, and then on May 15th, 100% decrease in effectiveness, so essentially going back to normal. Again, this uh, might not be uh, reflective of real uh, also, but it's closer. Is it um, too extreme? Maybe we're gonna be better at uh, mitigating uh, the transmission than these 50, 75, 100? I, I hope so. Um, and we're gonna keep other interventions in place again. So this is just affecting the effect of, stay, of a stay-at-home order and public gatherings. And in the third scenario, we're gonna say, what if we increased our vigilance and we're able to offset the transmission rate, um, of the, the effectiveness of reducing the transmission rate that we're losing by rolling back stay-at-home and allowing public gatherings? And what if we increase our vigilance and we all wear masks? What if we all wash our hands uh, really religiously and we um, do everything we can to try to stop transmitting COVID-19? It's not quite putting a bubble around each of us, but it's sort of like that. So even if we're in close quarters, we're doing things to mitigate that transmission. Um, so this is probably too positive of a view. Uh, we kind of already know that it's too positive of a view and where reality lies is gonna be somewhere between all three of these scenarios and hopefully between scenario two and three. So. This is what it would have looked like. Um, this is what the model that we're running projects it would have looked like had we uh, just gone back to end stay at home 100%, businesses completely open, um, allow public gatherings, hooks are playing at Whataburger Field. Um, there's conventions happening at the ABC Center. Um, this is what the projection is. And I, I wanna point out a couple things here um, because right now the model is very, um, it's very optimistic. It's, it's hoping that there was an actual increase in the transmission rate during the stay at home right now. And next week, we're, we're gonna update that. But for right now, we're gonna keep it where it's very optimistic, where it's saying, okay, well, we're, we're gonna assume that the stay at home had the same effectiveness across that whole uh, time period. And then on May 1st, it just kind of um, went, went away. So if we were to do that, there's clearly a, another uh, wave of COVID-19 that would be coming. Um, so that's that second wave in the coastal bend. Um, this is what it looks like with the stage rollback, and it doesn't look very different. Um, and again, we're having a very optimistic uh, look at what things are, at what's happening here um, during the stay-at-home order. Um, we're going to ignore the, the cell phone encounter index and say, well, that maybe that wasn't indicative of what was actually happening. We're going to assume that the stay-at-home order had a high level of, of, an, of effectiveness. Um, and once we roll back the, uh, the stay-at-home effectiveness in stages week by week, we end up you know, starting up that wave again also. Um, and uh, I don't think that uh, it's lost on anybody that we actually see an increase in our cases in the coastal bend area. Um, and these are saying that you know, we're probably gonna see some sort of increase in the number of people that are infected in the coastal bend area. In the third scenario, if we're able to increase our social distancing game and people that aren't wearing masks start to wear masks, um, it is at least within the realm of possibility that we could completely offset um, what's happening due to the rolling back of stay at home. If you like your job and you like making money um, and you want to keep along that path, wearing a mask is something that you can do to help make sure that you uh, don't end up in another stay at home that, that could occur if uh, COVID-19 really launches and threatens to overthrow, overflow our hospitals. Right now, we're not looking at that scenario actually happening uh, in the near future. Um, however, uh, it would be something that's possible here. We know that the transmission rate right now is above one. We know it was below one during the stay at home period at some point. What that means, we were declining. We're positive that we're increasing at this point. Um, and so, that's the thing that we need to keep a close eye on because we need to you know, balance on this razor's edge of um, go, getting back to life at the same time trying to stop COVID-19 from taking over our lives. So in summary, 
The new cases in the coastal bend are rising. Um, there's about 4.5 new cases per day on average. That's an increase from last week. Uh, most, it's most likely that COVID-19 is spreading in South Texas. So this is based upon um, our model that used to be looking at Texas. Now we're focused in on South Texas, Texas from Corpus Christi to Laredo and South. Uh, and the data that are telling us this are the cell phone data, the, um, the fatality data, and the epidemiological models that we're running are telling us that it's most likely that COVID-19 is spreading in the Coastal Bend area right now, and especially in Nueces County is really where it looks like that's happening. Um, also, just the data are telling us this. The number of new cases are increasing. Um, there's no evidence for a decline of COVID-19 in the Coastal Bend since April 23rd. We were declining. There's no doubt that we were on the decline, and there was a point in time when tests were increasing and the number of cases were decreasing. That did happen here in the Coastal Bend area, but that time's over. Both, uh, both testing and cases are increasing right now, and even with that, that increase in tests, it doesn't explain all of the variation, all of that increase in the number of positive tests that we're seeing. So all of these uh, data indicate that there is at least not a decline, and at best, if you wanna be super optimistic, maybe we're just staying even, but it's you know, very much likely that we're on the increase. So what can we do? Um, and this is my favorite part of the talk. I think Annette did a great job uh, of talking about what we can do, but I'm gonna reemphasize that we can do things ourselves to try to offset um, the end of stay at home. I mean, I like going to the store. I think everybody else does. I don't think it's a bad trade off to, you know, wear a mask if, if you go to the store to try to avoid infecting somebody. There is a fair amount of people um, that have COVID-19 that don't know they have COVID-19. Uh, some of the estimates are up to 50%. So you might not know you have it. And uh, there are studies out there that show that those people are still contagious. And thus, you might, know, you, you might think you don't have it, but you do. In which case, you wanna wear a mask to stop spreading it. You also wanna wear a mask to prevent yourself from contracting COVID-19 in the first place. And you might be thinking, well, you know, I was sick back in January, maybe I had it. You know, well, you kinda of don't wanna take that chance right now until you're able to get a test and really confirm whether you had it or not. Um, and so I I'm seeing more and more, my next door neighbor had a cheetah print mask the other day. Um, I, I personally like the camo masks and they're becoming more available and you can really uh, express yourself. And while you know it's kind of not the greatest fun thing to wear a mask, at least you can make the best of it um, with these different products that are out there. Um, it's important to self-isolate when you're symptomatic. It's important to stay home if you can. Don't make unnecessary trips that you don't need to make. Maybe postpone that party for a while or have a, a, a party online as opposed to a party in person. These are things you can do to um, decrease the transmission rate of COVID-19. Now, things that are outside of our, um, outside of our own uh, in individual abilities, but we can push for, more testing capacity. Um, more testing is better. And if we know who got tested and what the results were, that's even better for the modeling. Last week I was asked, you know, is more testing better for modeling? And I would say this week that it depends. Uh, it, it's better if uh, we know who got tested and what those results were. It becomes, you know, it, you know somewhat unhealthy if we don't know those, those things. Uh, we have to make a lot more assumptions. This enables the isolation of infectious people, therefore decreasing transmission rate. And lastly, uh, hopefully there, we'll see more of, of new treatments come along the line. Last week there was a report of one treatment that decreases the length of time that you experience the symptoms of COVID-19 by 30%. Hopefully we'll see more things like that. Um, and while seasonality may affect COVID-19, uh, there's no evidence that it does, and there is evidence from a lot of hot places from around the world that COVID-19 spreads there also. So we don't want to rely on that, like, oh, maybe in the summer it will, uh, it, 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 it will die down. And something that I pointed out to my neighbors, and I'll point out to everybody here, is that in the middle of July, I'm inside in cold AC. I'm not outside. And I think that's the case for most people in Texas, if I'm not at the beach. So, uh, like Thank all the people that put a lot of work into this. The task force is made up of a lot of people. Uh, there's different moving parts of this. 
and uh, there's several of us that are staying up late at night and not getting a lot of sleep every week, and I want to thank all of them for their, their hard work and dedication, and everybody else that um, chimes into the meetings every week and helps us um, with uh, understanding how to communicate the results of, of our analyses and modeling. So thank you. If we don't offset the um, effectiveness of the stay-at-home order by doing other things to stop the transmission of COVID-19, and it doesn't have to be 100% of everybody, but it has to be a majority at the very least. If we don't do those things, um, we will end up in a scenario based upon these models where we approach the capacity of the hospitals at some point in the future. Now, right now, I don't like projecting out more than a month, and we don't see that happening right now, necessarily within the next month. Um, but if we let the models run longer and let everybody's behavior stay the same, then that's the, that's the trend that we seem to be on right now. Um, but it can change, and people can change their minds, and people can alter their behavior, um, and it can affect this right now. Where we see that there's a relationship between the cell phone encounters and uh, exactly the amount of time that we would predict that you would start to see new cases, we actually see new cases that, in that amount of time. And so we do have control over this. Don't be fooled into thinking that we're powerless. Um, and each of you has a role to play in this. And um, if you don't want to wear a mask, you know, get curbside. You know, try not to go in, in the store. Or you know, hopefully you know that you already had COVID-19 and you're unlikely to be transmitting it or uh, contracting it again. All right, thank you. Okay, in resumen. Nuevos casos en el área de la costa están aumentando a 4.5 por día en promedio. Lo más probable es que el coronavirus se esté extendiendo en el sur del estado de Texas. De acuerdo a los celulares, a las fatalidades y a la epidemiología, no hay evidencia de disminución del coronavirus en el área de la costa desde el 23 de abril. Esto también de acuerdo a teléfonos celulares, fatalidades, epidemiología, porcentaje de casos positivos. ¿Qué podemos hacer para reactivar la economía en el estado y controlar la propagación del virus? Existen otras intervenciones necesarias para controlar la transmisión del virus. Los centros de control de enfermedades indican que los cubrebocas usados en áreas públicas disminuyen la transmisión. Autoaíslese cuando presente síntomas. Quédese en su casa de, en caso de ser posible. Se requiere de mayor capacidad de la realización de prueba y rastreo de contactos para identificar infecciones y permitir el aislamiento de personas infecciosas. Se requiere también de nuevos tratamientos para reducir los efectos del coronavirus. El cambio en las estaciones climáticas podría reducir la transmisión en el verano, pero no hay una seguridad. Ok, bien. Okay, that, prepared, uh, that uh, concludes our prepared remarks, and we, th we thank Dr. Bird for that great presentation. Uh, and Dr. Tissot uh, is here as well. Um, we want to thank you both for the time and uh, analysis and great work that you put into it this week. I did want to repeat, uh, that was on one of the Facebook posts. Uh, let me just get it here. If somebody wants to uh, review the slideshow, it is available on Texas A&M's website. So the location where you can find the slides that Dr. Burr just went through is it's www. and then one entire string of words Conrad Blucher Institute org. Okay, dot uh, uh, org backslash COVID nineteen dash task force. So if that's too complicated, you can go to the city's website. Right, the city or the county also has the slideshow. But the, if you want to see more information at the Conrad Blucher Institute, uh, they do have a website at Texas A&M University of Corpus Christi. So conradblucherinstitute.org backslash COVID-19 task force. Okay? Okay, great. So we want to thank everybody for watching, and uh, we're going to see if there's any questions at this point. Courtney? Uh, do we know how many or if any of the five uh, tested positive?
positive today were from the beef plant? Uh, Annette, they were right too. Yeah, so the question, in case somebody couldn't hear it, of the five positives today, uh, the question was, are any of the, were any of those from the STX uh, um, processing plant, meat processing plant, beef processing plant? The answer is yes. Two of the five were from STX beef. That's it, okay. Any other questions from the media? Okay, great. Well, that concludes our briefing for today. We'll be back here Monday. It'll be myself and Annette uh, Monday at 5 o'clock. Over the weekend, we'll still continue to produce that report that's on our website every day showing new cases, recoveries, and so on. So that's available around 4, 4.35-ish uh, uh, each day, Saturday and Sunday. We'll see you all next week. Thank you.